Good afternoon. It's good to see each and every one of you here as we uh, gather around God's word, as we continue our Lenten series. Uh, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I am uh, Pastor Matt Gerke. I'm the pastor at Trinity in Wisconsin Dells and happy to be with you here uh, today. So we begin our worship by singing our opening hymn, Lord to you I make confession. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Remember the wondrous works that he has done and has, and has done. All right, let's try it the other way. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continue. I just wanted to say this twice. Remember the wondrous works that he has done. His miracles and the judgments of O offspring of Abraham, his servant. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are all true. He remembers his covenant forever. The word that he commanded for generations. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end, that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us and has given us his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives the power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, 
It was your will that your son should bear the pain to the cross for us so that the adversary can have no power over our lives. Help us daily to remember our Lord's passion and to rejoice in the remission of our sins and our redemption from everlasting death. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We conclude, Lord, to you I make confession. Please be seated. Our first reading comes to us from that first book of the Bible, Genesis, chapter 50, where we hear the theme of our Lenten series. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph, saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgressions of your brother and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel reading. The Holy Gospel was according to St. Luke, the 22nd chapter. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house, The teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. This is the word of the Lord. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we continue with our children's lesson. And so, yes, yeah, so today, come on up, Josiah. He's all excited because he's going to treat all of you people <laughs> like your God's precious children that you are. That is right. And I won't ask you to come on up to the front this time, uh, unless you want to. Um, but we'll continue with our children's lesson. And uh, it's good to see you all today. I've got in my hands a planner. And uh, this book is pretty much where I keep all of my plans for the upcoming year and into the next year. Some of the plans that I write down are even two years in advance. And so there are a lot of plans in this planner. Um, and I would be pretty lost if I didn't have this planner because I do fill it up pretty well. So let me show you real quick. Uh, this is what most of my weeks look like, where I just have lines of things that I will be checking off throughout the course of the week. And most of these boxes are checked. Some of them get left unchecked until the next week, unfortunately. Uh, but that's the planner. And I spend a lot of time in my planner. Now, it wasn't so long ago, um, about two years ago at this time, uh, when it really started to feel like I could have taken this planner and thrown it in the trash. Uh, because there were a lot of things that we had had planned that we never got to see through to completion. And it was like that for several months. Uh, and when our plans don't go the way we'd like them to, it can be a little bit frustrating. Uh, and it can be extremely frustrating to feel like you are out of control. And the truth is that we are out of control most of the time. We don't have a say over some of the things that ruin our plans. And so the planners, they are valuable, but only to a certain point. Um, but despite all of that, God was still at work in his people, and the hope that we had in the future wasn't gone. And that is still knowing that even our plans for the future might not always work out, but we know that God does have a plan. And so the most popular, or one of the most popular verses in the Bible you've probably heard is Jeremiah 29, 11, I think. And it says, uh, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you or not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, we don't know the details of that plan that God has for us. Uh, and it's different for all of us. And for some of God's people, those details of that plan that God had for them included slavery in Egypt or exile from their homeland, or wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, or persecution, or like the life of Joseph that we heard about, it was um, a life of uh, some suffering, some time in prison, some time in slavery. Um, but in the end, we do know how God's plan will end. Every time, he, uh, when he says that he has a, a plan for a hope and a future for us, we know that that is the hope of a future in heaven with him for eternity. And that is something that we can cling to despite what happens to our plans here on earth. Uh, and so that is a hope that gives us comfort and something we can always trust in. So why don't we say a quick prayer thanking God for that now. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you so much for taking care of us, um, for keeping watch over our lives, and for taking things that seem like they could be really bad and using them for good. Uh, Lord, I ask that you would give us perseverance as uh, sometimes plans change. Help us to continue to trust in you despite changing plans. And Lord, help us to remember that when all is said and done, um, your plan for giving us a future of eternal life in heaven with you will definitely come and be ours. And Lord, we can't wait for that day. And also pray in your son's holy name. Amen. Thank you so much.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Question for all of you. What classic 1980s sitcom does this, is famous with this line? I just love it when a plan comes together. Anyone? You can shout it out. It's OK. I'll let you talk during my sermon, OK? The A-Team. That's right, the A-Team. Yes, in fact, I think if you go online, you can still uh, buy a shirt with that famous line from the A-Team if you so wanted to. Our gospel reading for today is the beginning of God's plan coming to fruition, of a plan coming together. But interestingly enough, it's the other players in the details that might suggest otherwise, that might make people ask, how could the suffering and dying be God's plan? Our text from Luke 22 begins with the jealous chief priests and scribes conspiring to kill Jesus, but they have a problem. The crowd! They're afraid of the large following Jesus has, and how could they get their, their hands on him without the crowd to stop them? And then Luke uniquely records these words. Then Satan entered into Judas. I think the tech kids today would say Satan entered the chat room. Now we've got a big gun out. Satan is involved. He's part of the planning. In fact, he thinks he is the planner. The chief priests and the scribes, they've got a problem. Satan enters into Judas, and their problem is solved. A betrayal when the crowd is not around. And of course, we know how this plays out. Their plan comes together. Judas does betray Jesus. The chief priests and the scribes condemn Jesus to death. Somehow they end up convincing a crowd to actually call for Jesus' crucifixion. It was Satan's wildest dreams, and it was happening. His plan was coming together. And he loved it. Many centuries earlier, another evil plan came together. A favorite son, the apple of his father's eye, was hated by his brothers. They couldn't stand the special gifts that their father gave to him, especially that annoying coat of many colors. They hatched a plan rather quickly. Some of them wanted to kill him, but that plan didn't last. Instead, they betrayed him, threw him into a pit, and then sold him into slavery. And then they made up the perfect cover story. They grabbed his special colored coat, covered it with animal blood, and said to their father, We found his coat. An animal must have killed him. It came together quickly, but perfectly. Evil conspired and won. And isn't that the way of the world? Evil has a plan. Satan conspires with just the right people, the people in power, or the rich people, or the people who know just what to do. Or he conspires with that family member at just the right or really wrong time. Sometimes we see this evil reality in even the pastor's office when a pastor is embroiled in a scandal. Sometimes we see it in churches, especially when embezzling is mentioned. Sometimes we see it even in Christian universities, in the midst of our own Christian homes and our own lives. And when people get caught, what might they say? Some people will say, well, I didn't plan this to happen. It just happened. Others won't take responsibility for their evil actions, and they'll say, no, it's your fault. But we know the truth. Satan planned it to happen. 
Others will try to say, you know, this isn't really who I am. Look at everything else I've done right. But the fact of the matter is, the damage is done. Satan knows where to strike. He finds that weak spot. And he's going to make it look like evil is dominating. But go back to that story centuries before Satan entered into Judas. Selling that brother into slavery wasn't evil enough. He eventually worked hard in that home of his owners, so much so that he became his owner's favorite. Someone he could completely trust. Until the owner's wife became infatuated with him. But when Joseph rejected the wife's seductive temptations, evil struck an almost fateful blow against Joseph. And he was thrown into prison. It looked like Joseph was now buried, gone for good, never to have any influence over anyone ever again. And yet by that evil move, it brought out Joseph's gifts of dreaming and interpreting dreams. And when Pharaoh had a dream no one else could understand, it was Joseph who could. All that evil planning became the vehicle for God's family, God's people to be saved during a seven-year famine. Oh, yes, they all meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. And he was able to save many lives through the tragedy of Joseph. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I personally find a lot of inspiration in the story of Joseph, a man that should have given up all hope more than once. But God's grace wouldn't let that happen. I know that some of the people we most admire are the people who have been through the ringer, and they're still standing. I mean, is there any more hope to the alcoholic than the AA leader who's been sober for 30 years? Is there any more strength that can be found in the battered woman than the, the battered woman who has escaped her situation and is now helping other women out of their situation? Is there anything more powerful than to hear how someone had evil brought against them? But evil still lost in their life. And now they battle evil in a powerful way. I mean, it's inspiring. It's hope-filled. These stories remind us that evil doesn't win. But no one ever says this. Oh, I'm so glad I went through that evil time in my life. No one chooses these things to be done. Joseph would not have willingly signed up to be betrayed, falsely accused, become a slave, and thrown into prison. No one wants to be battered and bruised. No one wants to have evil done to them. No one chooses that kind of life. But Jesus is different. He sees the evil in your life, and he does something about it. As Satan is moving his chess pieces into place, as Satan thinks he's calling the shots, I almost can't help but think that God is sitting across the board with that, an almost devilish grin on his face. Satan thinks he has the winning moves. All his pieces are in place. Judas, the high priest and the chief priest, the scribes, he still has a surprise move of the night, the denial of Peter. Satan has Jesus checkmated. Satan has surrounded Jesus with his evil plan, and now there's no escape. Except Satan is moving exactly as God had planned. Jesus actually chose this route. He chose to lay down his life for you. He chose to let evil look like it was winning. Those evil forces intended it for evil. But God brought it out for your good. In this case, God planned the evil against Jesus to bring about your salvation, to offer you the forgiveness of sins, 
He used the plan of Satan to make Satan completely powerless. He was able to save life by destroying death from the inside out. On Good Friday, Satan thought he had won. On Easter morning, there, were, there was no victory, no scraps, nothing to celebrate for Satan. He meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. And he won. But this was all done at the direction of Jesus. As Judas conspired, Jesus knew. As Satan entered him, it was all part of the plan. As they beat him and mocked him, he kept silent so they could do whatever evil they needed to do to him. On this fateful Passover night, he planned himself to be the ultimate Passover lamb to be slaughtered for all. And he chose this for you. And that's your hope this season of Lent. However evil has visited your doorstep, don't try to deny it. Everyone has had evil come to their door. If you're the one making evil acts, this is a time to repent. Find forgiveness in Jesus. If you're the victim, come and see the truth that the Paschal victim is alive and well. He reigns and rules into eternity. If you feel that because of the evil in your life that you have no future, come and hear about how you have an eternally free future. A future that will have no more evil, no more victims, no more abusers, no more diseases, no more conspiracies, no more war, no more depression, no more of any evil. For Jesus defeated all the evils that are affecting you. And if you feel that you aren't strong enough to deal with the evil around you, understand that this is true for everyone and that you're not alone. But God's grace is sufficient for you. If you feel that you're caught in the unending cycle of evil and hate, then hear God's word about how Jesus broke that cycle of evil. And he gives you a cycle of life and a true cycle of love. Hear how he chose to endure evil. He even directed it so that he could overcome the evil that's done to you. And in return, he leaves you with hope. All the evil plans will end. But God's goodness, God's goodness for you, that will last forever. And I just love it when God's plan comes together. In the name of Jesus, amen. We now continue our worship by singing our offertory. Please stand as we sing. Father, you know the ways we have hurt and been hurt, how we have rejected and been rejected, how we have blamed and been blamed. Yet we still come before your throne of grace, for we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belong to you. Father, we retreat and rebel. We isolate and insulate. We become cynical and sarcastic. 
Yet because of the love of Jesus, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who belong to you. Father, may your gospel empower us to stand by those who sorrow, stand with those who are rejected, and stand for those who have no voice, for we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who belong to you. Father, as we meditate on the cross of Jesus, sing the songs of Lent and claim the blood-bought redemption of our Savior, we are eternally thankful to be your chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, a people who belong to you. Father, lead us more and more into the way of the cross, the way of self-giving love, forgiveness, humility, and servanthood, for we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who belong to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We continue with Christ the Life of All the Living, hymn 420. Please be seated.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. And our closing hymn is hymn 424, O Christ, you walked the road. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And I pray that you have a blessed rest of your Lenten journey through our series and a blessed Holy Week and Easter celebration. God's blessings to each of you this week.